You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hello and welcome along to a brand new episode of the Straight to Video Podcast. Today's show is hanging on to the last few strands of Halloween that we can as we head into November and I got to land a chat with a favourite actor of mine who I reached out to some time ago but it's only now we got the chance to talk and it was well worth the wait. Strangely, as some of you know, we recently did a screening of The Return of the Living Dead, the 1985 zombie classic which we showed at the Savoy Cinema in Nottingham with our pals Lucy and Gavin of the Loft Movie Theatre. And just a few days later, I got to speak to one of the leading actors in that amazing film, today's guest, Tom Matthews. Not only did Tom star in this, what is a film that always delivers when I see it, but he starred in its sequel a few years later and also played the role of Tommy Jarvis in what many consider the best of the Friday the 13th movies, Part 6, Jason Lives. Several decades later, Tom got the chance to once again play that role in the super slick fan film Never Hike Alone from Womp Stomp Films and just recently starred in its sequel Never Hike Alone 2. As I mentioned to Tom, the term fan film is almost a disservice to these movies. Some might write them off before giving them a chance, but these are the real deal and for once, unlike the big studios, they're done for the right reasons with care for the stories, the characters and the legacy of the films that inspired them. If you're a Jason Voorhees fan, then I urge you to check Check these films out. This straight to video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, an incredible piece of photo editing software which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. I use it to create the podcast episode art where you see each week with the awesome video covers and it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. So please, if you can, check them out at affinity.serif.com. Tom proved to be a great guest and had many cool Hollywood stories to tell from his time on such iconic movies and some of the other cool projects he's worked on. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy hearing from him. Be sure to head on over to wompstompfilms.com or find their work on YouTube as it's well worth your time. But for now, please enjoy my straight to video channel with Tom Matthews. If you hear any banging from this end, it's because... It's your fat mate. Your fat mate has... <laughs> His girlfriend over or something. <laughs> no, it's our fireworks night. It's kind of our equivalent to your 4th of July. Oh, nice. Back in the days of history when a guy called Guy Fawkes tried to bomb the Houses of Parliament. Bastard. Yeah, well, I think he put like gunpowder in the basement or something like that and tried to blow it <laughs> up. But they caught him and for years later, we used to celebrate by building big bonfires and putting like a mannequin of Guy Fawkes on the top and burning him. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> but yeah, so there's explosions going off outside, so hopefully it won't interrupt us too much. Thank you so much for doing this for us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, my pleasure. How was your Halloween this year? Do you celebrate at all? It was good. Yeah, I went to, uh, I'm good friends with Randy and George Clooney. So we went to the Casa Amigos party over here. It was in Beverly Hills this year, as it usually is. But wow, man. They go to town. Do they like raise the bar? Really do. And the people, a lot of celebrities and stuff and the skin. The skin was flowing. I've been in Hollywood one year for Halloween and we just did like the walk down um, Hollywood Boulevard and stuff, which was just rammed. But what's it like at the parties? Do people like really go to town? Totally. Yeah. Yep. My friend who's very uh, macho, he came in a shark, this fucking shark thing. You can only see his face and just big old shark here. It just cracked me up. Can I ask what George Clooney was dressed as? He was not there this year. I go almost every year. He's been there, I think, once, 10 years. But Randy Gerber's there every year. And Mike Melman, he was a silent partner. Nice one. Did they have like bands playing or anything like that? No, a DJ and then, you know, four bars and dancing and, and stuff like that. How far back do you and George Clooney go? Let's see, uh, 85, 84. Yeah, so almost 40 years. Yeah, 40 years coming up, I guess. We met in acting class together. He was staying at his Aunt Rosemary's house. She kicked him out. He was going to go back to Kentucky. Right. And I said, you know, I have a very small flat, but I have a big closet that I built. So he slept in the closet for about a year. Things could have been very, very different if he'd have gone back to Kentucky. That's what he's, and he's, he's the first one to admit that. It was a, definitely a life-changing event for him, which, you know, I was, just, I was just being a good buddy. When I was doing Return of the Living Dead... George was sleeping in my closet. 
<laughs> so you come back and tell him about all the cool stuff that was yeah. going on. I'm unashamedly want to be one of those who wants to hear about Return of the Living Dead and Friday the 13th. But I was thinking, as much as you get asked about those films over and over, as we all get older, has it been valuable for you to continually revisit those times as it keeps the memories fresh? Because I struggle to remember stuff from a few years ago. Right, same here. Or yesterday. But here you are being asked about tiny details from something that happened almost 40 years ago. Well, I'm reminded of it and have the fortune of being able to watch it on the big screen. They'll have an event or something and they'll screen it on the big screen. So that's always fun. So that always, you know, refreshes the memory and stuff. And then we do the uh, horror conventions. You know, we're coming to the London and Film Comic Con in Olympia. Oh, superb. You're coming back over. That's coming on March, I believe. Oh, fantastic. Because I met you at the um, Sheffield Horror Con a few years ago. Really great turnout. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So I do that and I, you know, get to relive those two movies in particular because they're horror conventions. We're Comic Cons and get to see the cast and stuff. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. If you hadn't really considered being an actor until your girlfriend at the time suggested it, born and raised on the West Coast and in that environment, had it ever crossed your mind? I was born on Hollywood Boulevard, believe it or not. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I, it didn't even cross my mind until she mentioned it. Did you have any friends from school who'd gone on to work in the industry? From school? Well, yeah, I have a really good friend of mine, Tommy Dreesey. He was in my brother's class a year under mine. He was a, I was a, a senior. He was a junior at the time. And he went on to make standees. Those are the cardboard cutouts that they put all over for advertising, stuff like that. So he started doing that and did very, very well. And then he bounced off into doing the menus for the DVDs and different things like that. He just had a big thing for King Kong, I think, over here at the Cinerama Dome where King Kong was busting through the head of it. And it was... Huge. And I've got a good friend of mine who's a producer, has done some acting. He was in Spinal Tap. So, yeah, a few people. You mentioned standees from films. Those are the things that command big dollars these days. They're the really collectible stuff because I think people just threw them away or they was too big for people to store. They got all busted up. Yeah, they were in the way. You bet. I love all that promo stuff. I got to ask though, one of the most collectible things out there is the Return of the Living Dead 2 ceramic kind of sculpture of the poster. Do you have one of those? I've seen it. I don't. I do have, I do have this. Look at that guy. Brand. And it's got the fuck you on the back of it. Wow, that's fantastic. I didn't keep this jacket, but the one I really wanted was the other one. And the other one was made because the director thought maybe Return of the Living Dead might be shown on TV. So we had another jacket made and it said TV version on the back of it, which was, I thought was brilliant. So embroidered on the back, it said TV version. Was you a fan of films though, in general, growing up? Did you enjoy any particular movies or have any particular favorite film stars? Films, yeah. As far as, I mean, I like the thing, you know, and I was a really huge fan of The Omen. Yes. And The Exorcist, the only more so. And I love The Godfather. Right. One and two. That's kind of more of my uh, sensibilities, I guess. What was you into then as a teenager during like your formative years? Was you the music guy, the sports guy, a skateboarder? No, I guess I was more, I was the working guy because we were broke. So I had to, <laughs> I worked at the, a place called the Farmer's Market. And I was a soda jerk. I would scoop ice cream while I was in high school, make hot fudge sundaes. And back in the day, the farmers used to go there when it was a dirt road, Fairfax and Third. They would park and they would sell their goods. And then they started building lean-tos and then they became more a structure. Now it's the, called the Grove, but they did keep the older part where I worked. So that's still there. You know, it's like a, a little village. You can only walk in it. You can't drive and it all these different shops, the meat store, the cheese market, flower store, you know, a bunch of restaurants and stuff. You must have seen so many changes out in Hollywood then growing up there. Yeah, I did. I have. Back in the day, back when Return of the Living Dead was going on, there's a lot of punk rockers. I think that's where Dan O'Bannon got his inspiration. So Melrose, it was turning into an international street because a lot of designers from all over the world had the stores on there, but a lot of punk rockers were there. And like I said, where Dan O'Bannon got his inspiration from. First time I went out there, I couldn't believe, because I've been to all like the late eighties, early nineties, all the big hard rock bands that came out for that. I couldn't believe all those legendary clubs were literally just a few doors down from each other. Yeah, the Gazaris and the Roxy and all those places. The Rainbow, the Whiskey, just right next to each other. Yeah, the Rainbow and the Whiskey. My family's friends run the Rainbow and the Whiskey yeah. for years. And they did a documentary on it. Yeah, the Magliere's. Is that somewhere you used to hang out then? We did. 
Great pizza at the Rainbow, man. They have great pizza. When you decided to pursue acting, what was kind of like your first avenue you decided to take? Did you have any clue as to who or where to approach? Well, I knew I knew nothing about it, so I started studying. <laughs> so I went to acting class. Wasn't calling myself an actor, you know. And then I went to Lorimar Productions to work for them. And my sole purpose was to get my SAG card, have them put me on one of their shows. And one of their shows was they were doing Dallas... Knott's Landing, Falcon Crest, you know, Flamingo Road. Those were huge back then. Huge. And I worked in management services. My job was to fill all the kitchens all over the place. On the producer's floor, there was probably four different kitchens for the secretaries. who would go there and get their sodas. And, and then we had offices on the lot, so I would go down there. But eventually, I got cast on Falcon Crest as a walk-on. Had, I think, two or three lines. And that's how I got my SAG card. Did a ton of commercials. Really fortunate. I was booking every 10th commercial I went out on for three years. And then I got Return of Living Dead at the tail end of that. But yeah, I, it was uh, very lucrative. Did you audition for Cheers as well? I did. I kind of looked like Woody Harrelson. So, you know. <laughs> did you audition for that part? Yes. Yeah. They're after a specific look then. Yeah. I also, which broke my heart. So I did Return of the Living Dead and then got an audition for Platoon because Hemdale was the producer on both shows, Platoon and Return of the Living Dead. So there's a big buzz about me, blah, blah, blah. Went and met Oliver Stone. He was editing El Salvador with James Wood. Did you ever see that movie? It's one I always remember in the video shop. I always remember yeah. seeing it. You should go see it. It's really great. Yeah. He was editing it and we had our meeting and it ended up going to Charlie Sheen for some reason, but that one really, that one kind of stung, stung a little bit. I was going to say, was it tough to see that one once it came onto the screen? And Yeah, it was. Your role as Freddy in The Return of the Living Dead in 1985, I've heard you mention like that whole process it began almost a year prior to filming because you'd auditioned and then it was like nine months before you heard anything back. But Correct. Once you began shooting, how was it working alongside such veteran actors, James Caron, Clue Gulliger and Don Calfa? I mean, such iconic people and presences on the screen. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, I was just kind of doing my own thing. I was a very serious actor and just in the zone. Lucky enough, to be paired with James Karen, of course. And we came back in part two because we clicked so well because the Japanese wanted us to come back. They had the script for part two. They would pre-sell it to distributors to get some money to make the movie. Pre-sold it to France and Germany and the UK and these different markets. And then they went to Japan and they said, yes, of course we want it. It was a huge hit here. Uh, but please bring back James Karen and Tom Matthews. How are we going to do that? Exactly. So on part two, we found out that we were born on the same day. Right. We had the same birthday. So maybe that's why we gelled so well. And then we celebrated our birthdays every year after that, till he passed. You say you was a very serious actor going into that role. Yeah, I got my ear pierced and the director was like, oh my God, we could have faked that. I said, well, yeah. Was you prepared to go into a role which kind of combined both horror and comedy though? Was that a real learning experience for you? No, it was, uh, it was a dramatic piece. The comedy comes out of situations we were got ourselves into it's really a dark comedy it's not even a comedy it's a well it's a dark comedy we actually just did a screening of it in nottingham this past week it was the first time i'd seen it on the big screen because i'd always seen it on video everyone was laughing and being grossed out all in the right places yeah do you remember where you first saw it was there a premiere i saw it in here in la in westwood was that a big deal was it quite a big event it was yeah it was a big turnout well orion put a lot of money into the prints and advertising so it's a big turnout. How did it look for you sat there watching it? Had you seen any like dailies or anything like that? I saw, yeah, only because when you finish a movie and that sound's not right or there's the plane flying over, they have to get your voice over on a clean track. So I saw a little bit of it, yeah. The film soundtrack is perfection as well. Was you a punk rock fan at all? Absolutely not. So you didn't have any say in your wardrobe with like the Visage t-shirt? I did, I did. I was doing some print work and that company was hiring me for print stuff, fashioning their clothes and stuff like that. So I picked that t-shirt, cut it off, got the suspenders. And so that was all me. What about the bandana on the jeans? Because I only noticed that when I watched it at the cinema just the other night. I was like, holy yeah. shit, I've never noticed that before. Yeah. I saw that on someone walking on Melrose, some punk rocker walking on Melrose. I thought that was a cool idea. So then the guys from Massage, I invited them to one of the screenings and they were horrified. <laughs> <laughs> 
They hated the movie. They wa- I think they walked out. No way. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't sue me or somebody. Oh, that's... They were totally offended. You can actually buy those t-shirts online. If you put Return of the Living Dead Freddy t-shirt, it comes up with the Visage t-shirt. On it. Hemdale, the producers, gave me and my friend the worldwide rights to sell the t-shirts. Yes. We came up with the Send More Cops, Send More Paramedics, the Unita Medical Supply. We had the poster art as the t-shirt. We sold about, I don't know, like 30,000. We sent those all over the country. For the radio, the DJs could give them out as prizes when they were advertising. Skull Productions was the name of our company. Skull, S-K-U-L-L. We had an insert in the LP with all our designs on it and stuff like that. How long did that last for? A couple of years. Someone just, I was at a horror convention and someone brought me a cassette of the soundtrack. And I take it out because they wanted me to sign it. I take it out, I open it up. And there's like different things as you're opening it up. And there was Skull Productions on the back. I said, no in way. Oh, I love that. I never knew that. That's fantastic. Because I always say that I, when I pick up like old copies of Fangoria and things like that, you see all the ads in the back, all the merchandise. I'm like, right. there's got to be a warehouse somewhere. We had an ad in Fangoria too at one point. <laughs> there's got to be a warehouse somewhere with like box fresh, unsold stuff somewhere. There's got to be. I was on the cover of Fangoria, busting through, full zombie. I think we had the insert in that. I have a couple of prints of the magazine. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. What changed for you after that role? Did you find yourself in the spotlight from then on or was you immediately back to work? The change for me was my freaking attitude. I thought shit was going to start coming to me. So I wasn't auditioning as hard as I guess I should have been. But I did get, you know, Friday the 13th, part six, a year later. So yeah, you've said Return of the Living Dead. You've described that as pure lightning in a bottle, but you use a similar term that lightning struck twice for you as then you got the role of Tommy Jarvis. Two great parts. For an actor uh, playing Freddy in Return of the Living Dead, it's just uh, the arc of the character starting off as this naive, young, first day on the job and turning into this blood-sucking, brain-sucking zombie was just a lot of fun to play. It's stuff like that's almost highlighted in the credit scenes of Return of the Living Dead because they just take all the bullet point things. So it starts at the beginning, you just see all these clips from the film all condensed into one and you see how much things change. It's fantastic. I mean, a lot of people consider Friday the 13th Part 6 as their favourite of the whole series. That film seemed to hit at just the right time for like big 80s horror. And again, it really holds up. The opening scene is iconic to the series. My favorite, yeah. And first to introduce us to Zombie Jason. (laughs) Yes. I mean, all the credit goes to the director, Tom McLaughlin, because I think people like it a lot because it's the first one. I think you really, you got to know the characters and you were invested in them and you wanted them to do well. There's a little, you know, romance between myself and the sheriff's daughter. So that was optimistic and fun. And so you get emotionally hooked in that way. And then Jason shows up. Totally. I mean, I think a lot of the time in the Friday the 13th ones, it was just a matter of just getting some characters in for them to be killed. And we had that. We had that. Oh, yeah. You know, Tom specifically had 13 kills, the director. He had 13 kills. But the studio wanted a couple more. Ah. So they added five more. And two of those were the yuppie couple. They were out camping and he was having a picnic or whatever. So that girl was dating the deputy who I locked up in the jail. Right. And they're now married. So those are the two of the five extra kills that they added just to get kills. You know, CJ Graham played Jason and Jason lives. When wherever we're at the conventions, he'll sometimes write a signature, have a saying, and then he'll write 18 kills. <laughs> so when he does that, I just write one kill. <laughs> that's all you need. Yeah. If you do it right, CJ. If he planned on doing 13 kills, I mean, that's a real cool angle. The movie company went thinking this far ahead where we have YouTube videos where they have kill counts and stuff. I mean, that would have been really cool now. How many in part six? 13, obviously. Yeah, of course. And they should have kept it at that number. Yeah. You also wait many, many times with Albert, I pronounced it wrong, is it Albert Pune? Yeah, Albert Pune, yeah. On several That's canon great. movies from Dangerously Close, Down Twisted, Alien from LA. Do you have any particular favorites or ones which you'd recommend anyone should dive into, should they not be familiar? Down Twisted is a lot of fun. Yeah. Mean Guns has a different kind of soundtrack. Ice T's in there. Cool. A bunch of great character actors. Dangerously Close was one of the first one. John Stockwell, Don Michael Paul is in that. Yeah. Down Twister, Kerry Lowell's in that one. I love working with Albert because he wanted you to bring your own stuff to it. It was a very creative process. For example, for Down Twisted, the guy was scripted as like 240 pounds, dark, 
rooting, you know. So I started going to the gym because I knew I had the role of like three months. So I was going to the gym every day, beefing up, buffing up. And then I dyed my hair black, you know. I looked at myself in the mirror. I was like, that doesn't look right. So it just didn't go my skin tone. It just looked odd. So then I came up with a bright idea to bleach it out. So I bleached it all white. I didn't tell the director and I showed up on the set. What was the reaction? <laughs> the guy's name was Demoss, right? So, I mean, it was like, what are those images? So badass. You know, I got a, a silver cap on my tooth. I went and had one made. I found this really great blue suede jacket with the white hair. So I went down to Mexico the first day of shooting. Albert, he goes like, it's Demoss. He goes, I fucking love it. <laughs> So it was very, you know, Albert loved, you know, you bringing your stuff to it. So very creative. I think that's important. If you keep too much to a script, it's really allowing the actors well, to... Well, if you're really a good director and you've done some acting, you know, you want whatever makes it true for the actor, then it'll make it true for the audience experience, you know. Whatever images or emotions or take on it for the actor themselves. Also, Dan O'Bannon, you know, he, uh, in Return of the Living Dead, it was a very, very creative process. I remember... I was, we were going to work for about three weeks and I asked my mom something and she said, no. And in that moment, I realized I haven't heard no for three weeks because we talked about everything, you know? Yeah. We talked about every scene and, you know, James Karen and I would get together and we would go to Dan and say, what, what do you think about this? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was never that instant shutdown. It was, it was like, never, no. And which was unusual for a writer director because, you know, they poured their heart into the script and they want you to stick to it. So whatever images they were using for the script, they want you to try and convey that. I mean, every scene we talked about and some stuff we ad libbed. I mean, the scene that everyone seems to like, like this job. <laughs> That just came out of me while we were filming. James Karen, when he, he kills himself, yeah. that was all him. He came up with that whole bit. Wow. It wasn't scripted. You know, while he still had conscious of mind before he turned into a zombie, he went out and burned himself. But that was his whole thing. Because there's a really cool foreshadowing of that scene where Don Calfa first does it and James Karen says, I could work that thing. Anybody could do that. Right. <laughs> That's a real cool foreshadowing to it. But yeah. Yeah. That's what I like about Return of the Living Dead. It's a dark comedy, but it could have very easily just been played totally straight all the way through. We did play it pretty straight. I mean, in the office scene, for example, when James and I are, are sitting in there and he's talking about the thing, you want to see him? See him. The corpses. <laughs> I thought he was freaking overacting. Like a, I was like, oh my God, this guy's really chewing up the scenery. But that scene kind of encapsulates the whole movie, you know, right in that moment. That's the turning point of the whole film as well. Cause yes, it is. It's just Freddie being bored if he had to yeah. ask that question of what's the weirdest thing you've seen that entire film would never have happened yeah true. i love that part of it that's the whole left turn crossroads of it it's brilliant yeah. and i had the hat because i went and got my hair cut and i had it shaved and i had a little pigtail that i had bleached out so the director thought it was too severe for my character because it made me look really hard. So they gave me the hat to wear until my hair grew out a little bit. <laughs> it was pretty close to the skin. <laughs> I always wonder what Freddie's dynamic would have been in that group of punk rockers. Everyone is so different yeah. to it. And he's obviously an integral part of it, but you never see him really engaging. You know, I guess he was the alpha male because they were all kind of referring to him and hanging out with him. But he did have this sweet, yeah. innocent girlfriend who was trying to corrupt. Yeah, there's a whole backstory that could be explored there, I think. Yeah, definitely. for sure. We spoke about you landing the role of Tommy Jarvis in Jason Lives, but what do you think you would have said had someone mentioned you get the chance to reprise that role several decades later in the Never Hike Alone series of films? You know, I was hoping that Tom McLaughlin would write a, a sequel to that and kind of go off from there. You know, 25 years later or whatever. The history with Megan, us getting married, us having kids, us getting divorced because of my Tommy's demons with Jason because he knew it's still out there. But for someone to say I would have done it, didn't think it was going to happen. And then we did Never Hike Alone. How was you originally approached to appear in those? It was a weird story. I have a friend of mine who's a writer I've known for 40 years. He had a friend. So it was my friend and then his friend and then her friend. Her friend found out that he knew me. And for a year, would torture him. Please, you got to just fanboying. Please, oh my God. And, you know, I love Jason Lanza, please. But my friend was like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, next week. We'll do. So after a year, he goes, you got to help me out. This guy won't shut up. You know, I see him a lot. He just, every week he asks me to introduce, like, would you mind like having lunch or dinner with him? I said, sure. I mean, he's okay, right? He goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, he's perfectly fine. He just, I want him to shut up. He keeps bothering me. He's desperate. I said, okay, let's all go out to dinner. So there's a group of us, and we're out to dinner. 
During the course of dinner, he goes, you know, I'm executive producing a fan film. Do you think you might want to be a part of it? And I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> here we go. Oh, my God. Fan film. My career is really hitting rock bottom. I goes, yeah, sure. Send me the script. And he goes, oh, even better. They've been out there for like the last four months every weekend shooting it. They shot the first half of the movie chronologically. So you can see that, too. I said, great. Send it on over. You know, not expecting much. But then I, uh, I saw it. Production was amazing. The story was great. Very topical. Current. A blogger. He's doing a GoPro and selling stuff. Comes across the trail that's not on the map. Finds it. Gets curious. Goes to these cabins. And, you know, the rest is history. So I said, yeah, sign me up. So I met with the director, writer-director, Vincent DeSante. And we figured out where I would fit in the way the script was written. So we elaborated on a little bit on the paramedic thing, which kind of made sense to me. So we shot that. And, you know, I think it's got 5 million views on YouTube, a million views a year. And so that executive producer, Barry J, went on to write and direct his own horror movie called Killer Therapy. If you guys want to see something, it's been out for a couple of years now, three years, maybe. That's a good show. Very disturbing. So that's how I got involved in Never Hike Alone. And like you say, they're called fan films, which they certainly are from the angle that they made with such love from fans of the original movies. But in a way, it's almost like a disservice to call them that as they're of such a high production value. Well, particularly the, the Never yeah. Hike Alone stuff, because the quality is just the storylines are great. The cinematography it's is brilliant. beautiful, the great soundtracks. And, you know, Vincent DeSanti is really a, an encyclopedia of the franchise. He grew up back east and he grew up on a lake with forests. And his favorite movie was Jason Lips. Oh, my God. So that's how he grew up. So it was a dream come true to make a Friday the 13th. He ain't going to screw it up. <laughs> well, he did screw it up. Okay. That was the third version. What we saw, that was his third attempt okay. at making it. So they had a really long rehearsal. <laughs> they learned a lot. I mean, that's how you learn, by doing stuff, right? By the time I got involved, they had all the kinks uh, worked out. There's been like three of them so far. Never I Cologne, Never I in the Snow, and the latest one, Never I Cologne 2. That's correct. And I got the deputy visit, Guastafero, back in to do Never Hike in the Snow. I got him involved in that. So that was a lot of fun. Love working with him. He's also in Never Hike Alone 2. They all tie in together really well. In like, Well, they overlap. Yeah. So Never Hike in the Snow is actually a prequel to Never Hike Alone. And then Never Hike Alone 2 goes back. So if this is where Never Hike Alone stopped, Never Hike Alone 2 starts here. It kind of crosses over the same territory. The filmmakers really care about the continuation of the story and the characters, unlike what a lot of big studios do these days. Unlike the franchise of Friday the 13th, which makes no sense. And I think their success will grow and grow because it seems to be like a real anticipation to them these days. Yeah. Particularly when they bring back actors and characters such as yourself. I think because I got involved in that one, a lot of mainstream actors will do the fan films now. And because of the success of it. It's getting some big numbers. Never Hike Alone 2, we have like 100,000 views a day. People are watching it. And it's a great one for like word of mouth traction as well. People yeah. are sharing it. It's really well made. I'm really, uh, you know, I'm really proud of everyone involved in it. You know, everyone on the set, they're just huge fans from the AD to the wardrobe people. They were just, they just want to be involved in it. So it was really a lot of fun. Great energy. What's next for you once this current actor strike thing clears up? I think you have a movie Go Away with Tuesday Night. Yeah, that's coming out. And then we're just kind of waiting for the strike to get over. Yeah, I did a Western a couple of years ago called, uh, what was it called? Oh, Warpath. And I got that after doing Never Like Alone. It invigorated me and wanted to do more acting. So I bring that one up only because I have a, an on-screen song that I sing. Is that a first for you? Yes, it was. And I didn't want it to be a first. And I tried to get out of doing the movie because I didn't want to freaking sing. A lot of fun making the movie. Cowboys and Indians, stuff like that. And it's a throwback to the 80s too. The poster's great. But I didn't want to do the song. In the script, it was written, what he lacks in talent, he makes up for an enthusiasm. I said, look, I'm not a singer. Talking to the director, I'm not a singer. You don't want me singing in your movie. Because no, no, it's a, it's a very, uh, very integral part to the character. I said, okay. So I was shooting another movie at the time and it overlapped. So the one I was shooting ended here and this one, they wanted to start a week before. I said, well, I can't, I can't do it. This is my out. Because <laughs> no, no, we'll push everything. We'll shoot her stuff first. I said, oh. <laughs> so I leave the job I was doing on a Saturday night, fly on Sunday and go to Michigan. And the first day, on the job, guess what the first scene was of? Oh, no. Not straight in. The song. He 
He didn't let me ease into the role, you know, or anything. It's just like, boom. So how much of introduction did you have to the song? Did they give you a demo? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a folk song, so... And I kind of played it like that, you know, very... Well, I liked in time. I made up for an enthusiasm, so I got a lot of smiling and charm. And because I'm a bounty hunter, and there's a lot of traveling with the girl, because she hires me to go get her, find her husband. So there's a lot of traveling, going to find him and stuff like that. And she asked me if I wasn't a bounty hunter, what would I do? I said, Well, I'd, I'd be a singer. Oh, really? I said, Yeah. Didn't you know I had a pretty singing voice? You want to hear a song? She goes, Well, why wouldn't I? So then I I go into the song, I sung it on set, and then I went off with the sound guy, and we just got a clean track of it. You didn't check in with George. Harry did. Oh, brother, where art thou? And get some vocal tips. No, but that's another great movie, right? Yeah. I'll bring things to a close, Tom, but end kind of on a soundtrack kind of thing. I'll put you on the spot a little bit. I always end with the same question to everybody. I want you to time travel to a Friday night in the late 80s or early 90s and you're heading to the video store. What movie soundtrack do you have on the Walkman and what three tapes are you going to rent for the weekend? I grew up with Bad Company and my girlfriend was crazy about Led Zeppelin. So that would definitely be on the list. Probably Alien. Was Alien a big cinema film for you? Alien, yeah. Yeah. Dan O'Bannon, who wrote Return of the Living Dead. The scene he was saying, he told me, the scene where that the alien comes out of the guy, that was shot. They didn't rehearse that. They wanted the reactions of the actors to be like legit. What other videotapes? Two other choices. You can pick one of your own if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I never do that. Videotapes. Oh, gosh. Probably, I don't know, Ghostbusters and uh, The Omen. There you go. The Omen's the first one. I saw I saw that on video with yeah, my grandparents. Yeah. Great movie. Incredible yeah. film. So, um, is your wife still doing the dog rescuing? She is. She probably has 15. She's responsible for, I think she has 50 dogs, different places, in fosters and in boarding and that she's trying to find. She, we are trying to find. I'm desperately trying to find homes for them. But uh, yeah, it's a great cause, but it's, man, it's a lot of work, you know? It's a lot of work and they all don't get along. So you got to kind of rotate them around and stuff. Do you get quite attached to some of them? Well, we had probably three of our own. Now we have seven that we're attached to. Right. If we found homes for all the ones that we uh, are looking for, we'd have seven of our own, which is a lot of dogs still. It's a lot of dogs. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of picking up poop. <laughs> yeah, it is. She's very good about doing that. I have a construction company, so I, I leave the house every day and go do stuff. But she's she's great. I mean... You know, but it is different. We're lucky we have a big property, so big front yard, big backyard, and a side yard for some of the dogs. Would you have dogs growing up back on Hollywood Boulevard? Oh, yeah, all the time. German Shepherds, too, ironically. And my wife's uh, rescue is mostly German Shepherds. Yeah, my grandfather had beautiful white German Shepherds, King and Queen with her name, I remember. We had a great dog growing up, German Shepherd, pure black and a diamond, a white diamond-shaped patch of hair and he loved the water he'd go up to the high school go up on the high dive and jump off and go in the water and just a great dog you know they're all great individually all these dogs here are fantastic it's just accumulatively it's a lot a lot of dogs to deal with i'm going in you know i'm coming in the the door with, you know i'm leaving with stuff i'm coming home with stuff and i've got two dogs that want to get in and two dogs that want to go out and i'm like come on so at every turn, it gets kind of frustrating sometimes, but it's it's a great thing. I mean, what's the alternative? They'd be dead, right? Yeah, got to look after them. She's getting them from the shelter, so they have a list of which dogs are going to euthanize. So she goes and grabs them. But everybody's full right now, so it's, uh, it's not a good thing. What's it called? Is it the Puppy Coalition? Yes. Fantastic. People can check that out. Good memory. I always say the Tiger King has nothing on the dog rescue business. I'm telling you, the bickering that goes on between these women, it's just insane. The backstabbing. There you go. That's a reality tv show it's like a horror movie <laughs> tom thank you so much for chatting with me my pleasure thanks rob thanks for having me we'll see you in march in london yes at london comic-con okay thanks so much take care
shouting out and sending thanks to Tom Matthews for taking time to chat with me on this week's Straight to Video podcast. A real treat for me and hopefully for you out there too. Make sure to check out all three of the Never Hike Alone movies from Womp Stomp Films and it's never a bad idea to revisit Return of the Living Dead or Jason Lives. I'm going to be searching out some of those Albert Pugh movies too which we spoke about. And if you want to find out more about what Tom's wife Carla does with Dog Rescue, you can check out their website, thepuppycoalition.org. I want to let you know that from last week, all episodes of this podcast can now be found on YouTube. So if you want to listen on that platform, you can follow the STV podcast on YouTube and find them all there. The channel is close to 500 subscribers now, which I know is just a little blip compared to some channels, but I'd love it if you consider subscribing and help grow it a little more. So that's all for this episode, but as always, I'll be back next Friday. So until then, always be kind, please rewind and unwind, and I'll speak to you all real soon. 